So today I'm gonna to do something super risky. I'm gonna talk about a topic that many of us Muslim women, we only talk about privately in our own circles and within our own family. And especially not in public forums like YouTube. But today I'm gonna to bring it here. I'm gonna to talk to you about Maryam's story. And no, it's not gonna be a story of a forced arranged marriage, sorry guys. But it is something where I'm speaking to the Muslim community about how we are not practicing our Islam. Instead, we're practicing our culture and we're confusing all the non-Muslims, to be honest. And we're confused ourselves. We're actually not getting married the Islamic way. We're doing it the cultural way. And Maryam's story is an example of exactly what transpires when we do it our family's traditional way as opposed to the Islamic way. And if you want to know how to avoid that, because you could be going through that right now and setting yourself up for a failed marriage, just like Maryam did, Take a listen. So last week, we kicked off our love series with a podcast on why dating doesn't really work for Muslims. But today, I have an intense story, intense to say the least, about a sister we're going to call Medium, because I told you that in this podcast series, we're going to be bringing like real life stories of things that are happening to real young people in our community and even actually a little bit older, just people looking for spouses in general and kind of what they're going through in the process and all the different ways that they're trying to find spouses. Now, this particular story, I recently told to someone the other day and their jaw was like open the whole time. They were like, this stuff happens in the Muslim community? I don't believe it. And I was like, sister, this happens to hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of women on a regular basis. And you're going to find out why. But if you are looking for a spouse or know someone who is, or you're a parent who's just trying to like figure out the best way for your child, you need to hear this one. Hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, we can learn from each other's missteps and find a better way to do things. All right, so let's get started. Let's go right into today. So today's podcast is called My Culture Married Me. There's a reason, guys. One of the biggest problems for Muslims, and especially like when reverts, and um, this is talking to you guys, so I totally feel your struggle, when reverts come into Islam, is the line between culture and religion is really, really blurred. And it's blurred in a way that is not intentional. It's not like the people who are practicing Islam do it. It's just after a time, you know, as we're raised, uh, people who are born Muslim and they're raised there, they're finding that they cannot always know in the ways that their parents taught them what is actually from Islam and what is actually from culture. And because they're Muslim, they just assume it's part of their deen. There is a lot of that happening. And I'm not going to sit here and highlight which cultures it's more prevalent in, but it is in a lot of them. And for people who are new coming to Islam, it's really hard to navigate the water. So I totally feel you. And for people that are born Muslim and they want to do the right thing, they're struggling too. Now, this is a sister in a story that she actually didn't know she was struggling. She actually didn't know things were not Islamic that were happening to her. And actually, she was super excited to get married the cultural way. I'm not going to tell you a story of a sister who was forced into marriage or her parents did this or that. It's not like that. It's actually a story of a sister who was super excited about the way her parents were getting her involved. But at the same time, things didn't go so well because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suggests that we do things a certain way, there's divine wisdom in it and there's barakah, there's blessing. We do things a different way. We put ourselves at risk. There are things that we do not know, the unseen, the ghaib, the things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting us from. And when we choose a more cultural way to do things over Islam, it just doesn't always turn out so well. Now, it isn't that Islam doesn't allow us to practice our culture, but it's that our culture is fine as long as it is not against the way that Islam suggests for us. So instead of telling you everything that was not the right way to do things, what I want you to do today is I want you to listen to this story and take a guess. So I'm going to highlight this story and give you a quick snippet of it. And then at the end, I'm going to kind of do a summary of all the things that were kind of some missteps for the sister in the story. And in that way, you'll kind of be a bit more clear about what is from Islam and what is from our culture. And then you might even go the extra mile of going, whoa. I have totally seen those things happen in my own culture. I didn't realize they weren't from Islam. Or maybe 
you'll be like, ooh, my friend or another person in my community is just going through that right now. And I could totally see and I could possibly give them some words of wisdom. So wishing the best for everyone. We're building that village. And we need to kind of educate ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to reach for knowledge that is beneficial. And this is the rest of your life. These are not things that you want to do wrong. And my biggest message before I start this story to all sisters is, and brothers, because some brothers are listening with us and they want to get married too, is take this stuff seriously. I cannot tell you how many messages I get after the fact, after people are married and said, oh, if I only knew. That's what I'm hoping for this podcast. And that's a little sneak peek why I kind of did it before February, the month of love in in the West, because I want you to know what love really looks like and what the right way really looks like before you get swept into all the hype. All right, so let's get going. Let's talk about the story of Medium. Now, Medium's name is not really Medium because obviously I'm not going to use her name. I want to protect her as a sister. But I do want to tell you her story because it is way too often happening. So Mary is a young girl, and she was super excited to get married for the first time. Now, her culture did certain things that were just what everybody does. When I say what everybody does, I mean it is a very like more tribal culture where everybody kind of follows the same way of doing things. There's a way that you're going to figure out who you're going to marry. There's a way that you're going to interact with them or not interact with them. There's steps that are going to happen in how you actually go about the marriage paperwork, how you actually go about the wedding, how society expects in their particular culture things to go. And there is a lot, oh, when I say a lot, it's like an understatement, a lot of judgment for people to go a different way. Now, the reason is because there is a lot of misunderstanding of what Islam actually is in this particular group. And this is a a group that is, is very much the United States. And it is actually an amazing group and an amazing culture full of absolutely wonderful beings, wonderful Muslim brothers and sisters. But for some reason, the lines have gotten blurred. And this is what happened to Maryam. So Maryam was super excited to get married, and in her culture, what happens is the parents typically will look for the the groom for her, and she was totally fine with that because this is just like what girls do when they get to her age, and the mom would start to give tons of suggestions. Now, where things went is where the parents said, hmm, we know a really great boy who just happens to be the son of our best friends. How great is that? Because, you know, in this particular culture, people love to marry within their own village, within their own town or what have you. And they loved, especially if people were cousins. And this is very odd in the West, but in the Muslim community, it's not odd at all. And especially even the Jewish community, it's not odd at all. And, um, you know, so they wanted to marry cousins, be it like first cousin, second cousin. They just love to stay super tight with the family. Now, this particular um, person that was brought to her attention was not a cousin actually in the end, but it was the son of the best friend of the parents actually the husband and the wife. So her dad and her mom had like another friend or family friend that was best friends and they were all really, really tight. And they said, wow, this would be amazing if our kids would get married and then we could always spend more time with all, you know, all of us together. So it sounds super good. But the thing is when the parents were judging who is good and who is not good, they were doing it based on their cultural standards, right? And they really believed that these people were good because they were their friends and they thought that they were just going to be the perfect fit. So that was kind of how her situation started. Now, in her culture, um, you do not get to see the person that you're going to marry in person. Um, You don't really exchange photos. It's not something seen that is good. If you kind of want to look at them, you want to meet them in person, it is considered inappropriate. Let's just use that word. There's a word for it in in, um, in their language, but we're going to call it inappropriate. It means that you are loose. It means that you are no good and you are just trying to be un-Islamic. So they were not allowed to actually see the person, but they, because it's a small village, they did actually see them in passing. They had an idea of what they look like, but in the case that they were not in the same town, they would just be instructed that their mom said that they were a great fit. Their aunt said they were a great fit. And then they would just be like, okay, I take their word for it. And so they ended up making an arrangement where the, the two families agreed to get married. Now, where things got a little bit more different is where the they, um, they actually got to the point where they were going to actually sign the paperwork. Now, I'm not going to say the word or terminology for that in Arabic because I find so many cultures call it so many different things. And this is part of our problem in Islam. 
And so the crazy thing that happened next is in their culture, the girl is not even allowed to attend her own wedding papers. Now in Islam, you typically have this time where you sign the contractual papers and the time where you throw the big party. And again, there's different names for these depending on what culture you talk to. Everybody calls it their own thing, even there's only kind of like one Islamic name for it. But they had this particular way where they believed that the girl should, again, not go in front of the boy. And if she did, it was loose and that meant that the family was loose and that was completely inappropriate. So the two fathers sat down and signed the paperwork. The boy could attend, of course, because it was like he wasn't going to be there with the girls. It was all men. And because it's a very secular um, society. Yes, in Islam, we are secular. But in this particular culture, because some cultures have let go of that, they do keep to being very secular, male and female. So they don't go in the same rooms. They don't mix. They don't hang out. So they all signed the paperwork without her. She was not even present for her own wedding papers. Okay, so let's get back to the story. So now you might find it odd that the girl was not able to attend her own wedding, you know, contract ceremony. But the truth is she really didn't care because in her culture, it was seen as something that just happened. The men go, the men meet. It's seen as something that they think is just the way marriage works in Islam. So she wasn't upset at all. I know some Western thinking people might be like, oh, that's appalling women's rights, la, la, la. No, she didn't really care, to be honest. But the thing is, um, fast forwarding, they went and they actually, um, you know, after that have to get married and do the, the marriage ceremony, right? Where they actually have the party and everything. But guess what? In this culture, they actually have some particular things that happen in a certain way between that marriage contract and the actual wedding party that I think are worth noting. So first of all, um, in the culture, once this contract happens, you'd like, oh, they're, uh, you know, totally, you know, legally married. I'm sure they can all just start to live together or do something or hang out, go out to restaurants. No, not only can't they do any of that, that'd be considered completely ridiculous in their culture, but they can't even talk to each other via phone in person. Their families can't visit each other, sit with each other, eat together, nothing. It's considered if your family does that or even suggests to do that, that you are extremely loose. You are a loose Muslim. And so there is no talking between the two spouses, basically. They're they're married now at all all. And this is the way that their culture sees that it should happen. Now, it might seem like really difficult if it was just like a month until their marriage wedding, you know, but let's just say this culture also has another thing that they do, which is they keep them each in their houses, can't talk, can't see each other, nothing like that. Now, there are some some groups within the culture that are breaking out and getting more quote unquote modern and allowing them to talk a little, exchange a little something. But for the most part, society-wise, outside is considered totally inappropriate. So they're not just going to wait a month, guys. They're not just going to wait two months. I've seen them wait a year, two years, dare I say, three years before they actually have the wedding ceremony and party. Yeah, they have to sit in separate houses. They can't even chat at all, get to know each other, even though they're married, nothing. So fast forward, let's just fast forward into the the wedding party. They finally get married. It's been about almost a year and a half, two years. They do the party. They're actually both super excited. They're they're attracted to each other. They feel like this is going to work. The wedding day was great. Everything was fine. There was a little bit of a back and forth between the family, though, on that day of the wedding. And some words were exchanged between certain people because, you know, they didn't like photos of the bride. And that's another thing, taking pictures of the bride and sharing them. These are things also they don't do in their culture. It's considered like, why would you want your wife's pictures to be shared across the internet and yours? And all these guys could look at her. That's considered ridiculous. That's something else in their culture. And um, anyway, there was a little scuffle and there was a bit of a back and forth. And, you know, long story short, the family was a little stressed on that day. So now the girl, the other thing with the culture is it's totally typical. And this is like kind of worldwide. You see this a lot sometimes um, is when she gets married, she's supposed to go live in the other family's house, right? The house of her husband. So it's typical that the girl will go live there, the daughter-in-law, right? And she will take care of most of the um, work in the house, 
the mom has done all these years, you know, raising her kids. Alhamdulillah, one of them got married. The son, he brings the wife into the house and she should take care of everything. She should take care of, um, you know, the cooking, the cleaning. Maybe she will help with the other siblings. If any of the um, parents are sick or elderly, she will care for them. It's just understood. So she goes into the house and she starts to live there. And, you know, she's fine with it again, because it's what happens in her culture. She thinks it's totally fine. She's never known anything else. And this is part of the excitement of getting married, you know, going to your husband's house and, you know, being with the family. So anyway, so she goes into the house and the first day was okay. It was a little bit weird. But then by the second and third day, some things started to just like, there were red flags for her, right? The family, he started to say, her husband started to say he, she couldn't go and visit her family's house. She couldn't go sit with her mom, her dad, her brothers, her sisters. In fact, he was just going to cut most of the communication away. And, you know, at first this was something she felt strange, but you know, as you're newly married, you're kind of in love with the guy already, you're excited or whatever. And she didn't really understand the the brevity of what he had said. So anyway, so time passes and she noticed that he starts to get a little bit more controlling, a little bit more angry, just within even a week or two. It was just very odd. Like he just, something was off and it was so weird because the families got along all the time so well. Next thing you know, he's taking her phone. He's telling her she can't communicate outside. She can't go outside, nothing. And culturally, you know, the female that's supposed to listen to their husband, but he was cutting her from her family completely. And then, you know, also within that time, you know, women do what they do, which is they want to get close to their husband. So then she started to tell him some stories and things that she wasn't so proud of. You know, she had made tawbah and she just wanted to be really honest and open with him and for him to know some of her, her missteps in her, her lifetime so far. That did not go over well. That just made him even more nervous and more angry. And in fact, there was just altercations back and forth. He went ahead and recorded her divulging of her sins, basically, of whatever they were. And they were not such big sins, actually. But, you know, they were just small things that, you know, you wouldn't want everybody to know. He took those recordings and he shared them on social media, on different things like WhatsApp or whatever. And subhanAllah, he even told the family in the house they all started to look at her very, very badly with some disdain and treating her badly and teasing her. And then all, it just, it just turned a mess for her. She was living in that house. It was like a trap. She couldn't get out. She couldn't go to her family's house. Even though they were across the village, she couldn't do anything. And, and that was it. And he started to get super, I don't know. It seemed like he was bitter. And I will add this other thing about the culture. So in the culture, and this happens again in many other cultures, is that when a one of the spouses has citizenship in one of the big Western countries, that's considered something special. And so the girl had citizenship in another Western country and the boy didn't. And so when the boy goes to pay the mahar or the dowry, he was charged a lot of money by the family. He, you know, usually you could typically charge guys 30,000 50,000. I've seen up to a hundred thousand dollars to marry their daughter because she is a citizen of a big Western country. And this usually is something that's understood. Families will negotiate, but they end up usually paying. And then usually the guy does feel a little bitter, you know, because he's paying all this money. So he has all these expectations for the wife and, and you know what he's allowed to do now that he paid all this money. And people will be like, oh my gosh, what is the girl a cow? Like, what is that? Is that how you sell your daughters? But it's not seen like that in the culture. So I just want you to keep the perspective clear, like to them, it's normal, right? So um, he was just acting a little bit extra weird more than usual. So fast forward to what happened next. So it got really bad. I mean, the teasing from the family internally, and now all the people in the village heard about all the stuff she did. And we don't really know why he would do that, because typically a man would not want to share things about his wife with other people, especially if they were not so savory. But that's what happened. She was an emotional train wreck. Her family was livid that she she was being cut off from them. And it came to the point where she had to actually like escape, run through from the house one day to the, across the village to the other house, just so she could be back with her family and they could start negotiations to see what is going on and take back, you know, the power over what's happening to their daughter. Now I'm not going to bore you with the details of all of that, but let's just say within a month, a month and a half, they were divorced. So that might sound like, woo, good thing she she like, you know, missed that bullet. At least she got out. At least she at least didn't have a baby with him. Things didn't get more difficult. But the truth is, in her culture, women who are already married are considered used goods. 
if she already was married and, you know, they consummated and everything like that. And now if she wanted to remarry, it was considered, like I said, she's used goods and it would be really hard to marry her off. Even if she was a totally good person, and even if she was pretty and came from a good family, whatever, it's considered like something that is not attractive whatsoever. And sometimes girls can sit in their house for years and years and never get married. It is a huge problem in some cultures. So that's where I kind of stepped in with her and I talked to her. She had reached out to me and we started to work through some of what was going on with her family. I even talked to one of the family members that were kind of, you know, working on her whole situation with the marriage. And we realized that we didn't have to look within that village. We could look outside the village and try to find a spouse with her that for her that was appropriate. And this time around, she did it differently. This time around, we talked about what the boundaries of Islam was. And this time around, they said, wow, we could see how our cultural approach did not work for us and we are going to try a different way. So before I get into, I'm not going to get into details of that because we don't have a whole another hour or two hours or whatever, but inshallah ta'ala, as we come to my Facebook lives, like one after one after one, and we get to the last one where it's kind of like the culmination of how I'm going to explain to you how you look for a spouse in Islam, because there are, there's just so much information. I cannot share it on a podcast and on, on every single time I get to sit with you guys. But I do want to tell you there is a way easier way and a way better way, but the culture pressures are real. And now I want to get to the part of the podcast where I talk to you about the missteps, what was clearly not from Islam and what is clearly from Islam. Because what I need people to know who are reverts, I need them to know that this is not Islam. This is totally cultural. Even non-Muslims, if you're listening, I need you to know that. If you are Muslim and this is something is happening in your family to you or to cousins or friends or other people in the community that are even of a different culture than you are the same, doesn't matter. I need you to know this is not Islam. So much of this story is not Islam. So let me just go over a little summary of the things where the lines were blurred and culture took over religion, okay? So the first one is the number one biggest problem is that the that the culture was not aware of the Islamic rulings and teachings. They kind of did their own thing. They did what they thought was what they should do without actually seeking for sound Islamic knowledge. They went with the way of their forefathers. And the Quran always warns us of that, just saying, ah, this is what our forefathers did, so it must be good, and having cultural pride. This is actually totally um, un-Islamic because the cultures have done tons of things over the years, and we don't know what is actually appropriate or not. We're encouraged to seek knowledge, kind of like what you're doing right now, kind of like what you're doing if you attend my my lives, my my um you know private Facebook group that I just made, whatever, my upcoming webinars, whatever. That's what you're doing. You're seeking knowledge. It's kind of like the modern way, right? But anyway, the next thing, the problem was there were just so many problems where the culture trumped the religion and even her human rights. So let's just go through the quick things that were kind of Islamic violations. So the first one was, you are totally allowed to see your spouse before you get married. You are totally allowed to sit and even talk to them. And I can't get into all the details of how and what you're allowed to do and the boundaries. And you guys are going to DM me with tons of questions. I'm honestly unable to go into all of it and answer all your questions in this particular way. I'm going to do, like I said, Facebook lives. I'm going to do Q and A's. I'm going to do webinars. You're going to get your chance. And I even have an upcoming course called the Muslim marriage lab, where I'm just going to literally divulge it. I have gotten like so many tools that I'm going to give you that you will just love. And they're all just pre-packaged, pre-done, and they're step by step by step of exactly what to do with visuals and whatnot. And you're going to love it and you're going to get all that information, but it is in depth and is not something I can cover in this way. I'm just being honest. So the next thing I want to say is you are not supposed to delay marriage that long. You are not supposed to wait a year, two years, three years before you actually do the ceremony and not talk in between. That is actually not okay. It causes a complete fitna between the two people. The next thing is family ties and kinship are important. You are supposed to be able to be in contact with your family. No no spouse is ever supposed to cut you off and control you. That is actually completely against the tenets of Islam. And no man is actually ever supposed to treat a female in that way or embarrass her or share her sins across um, you know, anything, even to one person. It's just not at all appropriate. That's what's inappropriate, <laughs> not what they thought was inappropriate. The other thing is, um, you know, when 
when we talk about mahar and dowry, dowry is not supposed to be like that. Just because you have a citizenship does not entitle you to anything, literally, even a dollar more. That is totally a cultural practice that was created that made a complete burden for the men in that particular society. Again, this is an incredible culture, incredible people, like the most loving, generous, humble group of people you've ever seen, this particular group, and I know them. But at the same time, we cannot stand there and not highlight what is clearly from Islam and what is not. And that's just our duty as Muslims and my duty to you to let you know. And then the other thing is, um, in the end, the female is never supposed to look at like, like she is used good. Actually, in Islam, it was encouraged to marry the widows. It was encouraged to matter, marry the divorcees because it was seen as a complete humility and like an act of kindness and empathy and generosity. And it was seen as something beautiful where the men were taking care of the women who are left unprotected. It's the exact opposite in Islam. That's what's so crazy. There were just so many parts of this cultural um, story that made it so hard for her, so hard for her to have happiness. It is actually so easy. And all of these things that were created that are, are technically bida, you know, their, their innovation, are actually totally outside of Islam. So I really, really hope that you guys understand the risks, the complete risks. This girl went through so much emotional trauma and there were so many things. You can just understand the drama that might've happened and it totally is unnecessary. As, as women, we have so many rights, but we have to know our rights. We have to know everything about how we're supposed to go about marriage. And I want you to know that I have tons of um, resources and stuff, but I want you to try to join our Facebook live today. I want to keep talking about this. I want to hear your thoughts. Thoughts. I want to hear your comments. I want to hear your questions. We're going to do a, a short Facebook Live and a Q&A. We're going to meet together at 7 p.m. tonight, inshallah ta'ala. And I'm soon going to be announcing my private Facebook group. We're going to have a five-day challenge. It's going to be fun. Where you're going to start to do some introspection, some retrospection, some like ways to figure out exactly how to find a spouse for you based on your personal issues and preferences and conditions and whatnot. And there's actually just going to be a fun $250 prize for the person who makes it to the finish line and everybody has a fair chance and it's all in good fun, but it's to help you actually, um, you know, in all honesty, to find what's best for you. We are all a community. We're trying to build that village. There are people going through the same things as you. There's no reason to do it alone. So I'm super excited we could have this chat. We could talk about Maryam's story and we wish the best for Maryam. In the end, alhamdulillah, right now, after I talk to her, she's actually on her way to marry a very good brother in Shalat Ala. They're doing sit-downs a totally different way. She's actually allowed to talk to him now, and she's allowed to exchange and, and see her ideas. And who knows? In the end, maybe she will not even choose him. But that's her choice. Now she has more of a choice because they finally come to the understanding of what Islam actually permits, and they're open to that for her. So I'm so happy that I could help make that happen for her and that her story, in the end, has finally had a better ending. And we wish her well and make dua that she finds the coolness of her eyes. Thank you so much for joining, guys. Hope to talk to you in the next one where we reveal another amazing story from a sister in our community. Talk to you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa